Hi everyone, welcome back to the History in 20 podcast, we're talking about the Black Death today. So it's slightly different because we've just finished the Plantagenets mini-series, so this is a special request. So here we go. So we've all heard of it, but what was it and when did it happen? Where did it come from? Who did it affect? What did the contemporaries of the time think of it? What do people think of it now? So just a few of the questions I'll attempt to answer in the next 20 minutes or so. So Black Death or Plague? So the Black Death is a strain of plague. It's the name given to the strain of bubonic plague, um, which ravaged Europe from 1346 to 53. And the peak years of the Black Death are generally seen as 1348 to 52. Um, To this day, it's still the most devastating natural disaster in recorded human history. But the Black Death isn't actually the first instance of a major plague pandemic in Europe or in European history. So... In 541 AD, the plague of Justinian, which was named after the Roman emperor at the time, hit the Byzantine Empire and the Eastern European Empire, which caused mass deaths. So a lot of contemporary sources estimated and largely over-exaggerated figures that between 25 million and 100 million people were killed, which at the time, I mean, that is a massive over-exaggeration, but even so, it's still a huge amount of people did die from the plague of Justinian. So if so... Why is the Black Death still so significant if that many people died then? Well, the point is the Plague of Justinian lasted for just a year. It was eradicated by 542 AD. But with the Black Death, waves of this bubonic plague uh, during the aftermath of the Black Death continued to hit Europe throughout the 14th century and even about to return throughout the 15th and 16th centuries. And obviously the cultural, social and economic impacts of the Black Death were absolutely enormous. So... We'll start off with what was it? So the simple answer is bubonic plague. You get some historians who argue that it wasn't bubonic plague, it was anthrax, so it wasn't caused by fleas. So historians like Graham Twig, but for the main part, it was bubonic plague, and that's what I'll be arguing anyway. Um, so what symptoms you get from bubonic plague? Well, the most recognisable symptom are bubos, which are huge black boils, which affect the lymph nodes in the body, so primarily they were found on the neck groin and armpits and you've got other symptoms which included those similar to a fever so once a person contracted bubonic plague during the black death they could expect to live for anywhere between two days to a week and it would usually be they'd usually be living in excruciating pain from the bubos which were renowned for bursting so if you can imagine the pain they go through there with obviously no or very little sanitation or knowledge of uh, medical science that we have today So where did it come from? Where did it hit Europe from at first? So the Black Death is often attributed to the Tatars, who are more commonly known today as the Mongols. So although it actually probably originated in China, the Mongols spread it rapidly to India and then into Europe from their conquests under Mongol leaders, such as the family of Genghis Khan and stuff. So they brought it into Europe and... uh, the Black Death was originally thought to have been carried by black rats, which the scientific name is one of the best ones out there. It's simply Rattus Rattus. Uh, but it was actually from fleas on the rats who transmitted it. So obviously in the towns and uh, cities in Europe where there's de- hugely dense, densely like populated, um, these rats thrive in those cities. And obviously the fleas live on the rats, they jump onto humans, bite them, and it passes on. Like that. So, if we get into Europe and the Black Death, the first recorded case of the Black Death in Europe was when it reached the Genoese colony of Kaffa in the Crimea, which was under siege by the Mongols in 1346. So, it was in an example is in one of the most notorious cases of biological warfare. The Mongols catapulted these plague ridden corpses over the city walls of Kaffa in order to break its resistance, and it worked. And the Genoese defenders of the city rode away for safety. The Mongols took over the city. But that was a huge mistake because it inadvertently spread the plague to the rest of Europe in huge swathes over the next decade, really. Um, Obviously, the infected corpses landed in the city. It was transmitted when they tried to get rid of these corpses, fleas jumping onto the uh, other carriers of the disease, and they rode away from the city into different cities, spreading it that way. So the plague reached a key Mediterranean port by October 1347, which was Messina in Sicily. Now, this was one of the worst affected places in Europe during the Black Death because it was a key trading route. So with more ships continuing to arrive in Messina, more people were spreading it to other trading areas along the Mediterranean and North Africa. 
So by January 1348, the plague had reached Genoa, which is obviously a major trading hub and colony in Europe. And it had reached Genoa by a galley which had actually come from Caffa. So the Genoese governors, in a move which even today is somewhat reflective of governments in the coronavirus pandemic today, they banned the galley from stopping at Genoa. So in doing so, they saved Genoese citizens, very temporarily, but they hadn't instructed the galley, the galley sorry, where to go. So it sailed on to Marseille and Venice, which ultimately spread the plague further through the Mediterranean and into mainland Europe from there. So 1348 is arguably the most important year in terms of the Black Death and its reach. So it spread through to Pisa and Florence, which was another major trading hub in Central Europe and Italy, and on to Paris. And in 1348, it crossed the English Channel and reached England through the Bristol Channel. And from 1349, it spread eastwards through Germany. You might be able to see on the picture of the map that I've got up on the screen now. Um, and southeast into the Balkans. And by 1350, it had spread as far north as Scotland, Denmark and Sweden. Which this argument goes against what people like Graham Twigg argued earlier. That it's a climatic thing. Clearly it's not because you've got it in Scotland, Denmark, Sweden. And there's even evidence of it in Iceland which is not very warm up there, so it doesn't necessarily have to be warm in order for it to spread. It's spreading through Europe in the winter months, so that's one argument why I think it is bubonic plague, but that's my take on it anyway. So how did contemporaries react to this? So although there were a lot of contemporary chroniclers writing about the Black Death, I've sort of cherry-picked three or four just to give you a decent idea because they're from different kind of areas in Europe and I thought that might be an interesting approach, but... I can definitely recommend having a look at the book The Black Death by Rosemary Horrocks, which is a collection of, uh, translated into English, um, contemporary sources at the time and their reactions to The Black Death. Really worth a look. You can get copies on Amazon or World of Books and eBay and stuff like that. So the first sort of contemporary I've decided to look at is a guy called Giovanni Boccaccio. Now, Boccaccio was born in Florence in 1313, so he was in his mid-30s when the Black Death struck his home city of Florence. Now, he estimated that 100,000 people had died in Florence as a result of the Black Death. But as we discussed earlier with the Plague of Justinian, contemporaries were likely to over-exaggerate these figures. Um, and in fact, those figures have since been disproved because the total population of Florence at the time wasn't even 100,000. So recent estimates suggest that maybe as many as 50,000 died, which still is a staggeringly huge amount regardless. Um, but Boccaccio is most famously known for his work called The Decameron, and that was written as part fiction and part non-fiction. It tells the story of a group of wealthy Florentines who escaped the city and stayed in a country house, for the self-isolating maybe, uh, and the tell tales of the Black Death to pass the time. Now Boccaccio died in 1375, and he survived the Black Death, and this work was one of the most poignant works of the time. Uh, and gives us a good understanding of how perhaps the wealthy did survive this, moving into their country homes and stuff. Um, and actually another chronicler I looked at was a lawyer from Piacenza in northern Italy called Gabriel de Moussi. And he took it upon himself to write a chronicle about the Black Death. So at this period, chronicles were largely reserved for monks and clergymen. And the fact that he took it, up, took it upon himself as a lawyer to write it shows that he recognised the importance it would hold for the future. And he called his chronicle the Historia de Morbo, which is the book of death, I think it translates as. And he described the Black Death as we know it today. So when he was describing the siege of Caffa, he used terminology such as the whole army was affected by a disease which overran the Tartars and killed thousands upon thousands every day. So he knew then, like he could see the destruction that this was having upon European society and Actually, de Moussis died in 1356, which was shortly after the worst years of the Black Death. So he was right there in the prime of the Black Death when he was writing this work. And the third character I've taken to look at is Pope Clement VI. Now, he reigned from 1342 to 52, and he ruled throughout the entire period we know as the Black Death, and he survived it. So initially, he stayed at his papal seat in Avignon uh, before eventually retiring to one of his country retreats on advice of his advisers. Uh, away from the city where he stayed between two roaring fires day and night in sort of the presumption that warm air would keep plague away. Now miasma was one of the theories that plague spread through and miasma is bad air which is why you'll see a lot of those plague doctors with those masks on 
they were filled with herbs and sweet smelling spices and stuff to keep away this bad air because they thought it was transmitted like that and really looking at it it's not necessarily they're not far wrong it was spread through the air but not like through smells so anyway pope clement VI sits in his nice warm castle day and night and yes although he survived the plague his reputation has largely differed between historians so some of them commend him for staying in avignon for as long as possible which is fair enough while others kind of berate him for running away from his post as pope and the latter argument is also a suggestion why many people during the Black Death lost faith in traditional religious structures at the time. So if the Pope had run away into hiding rather than sitting and facing it and telling all you know, the common people how to deal with it, why should they take him seriously? And that's why you get a lot of these responses to the Black Death. So one of the first responses I'm going to talk about, the social responses, I'm kind of, obviously there was a lot to talk about and unfortunately I can't cover it all in 20 minutes, but I'll do as best as I can. So... Two main ones I'm looking at, the social responses and the Jews were a scapegoat. Excuse me. So, as ever in medieval Europe, there was an overarching need to blame someone or something for the transmission of plague. Obviously, as I discussed earlier, rats were one theory. But to many Europeans at the time, and the anti-Semitic nature in, you, in medieval Europe, Jews were a more obvious scapegoat. So, the Jews were one of the most obvious groups to blame and the initial rumour was that the Jews poisoned wells meaning that the plague was transmitted through water systems and they're meant to pass it on to the Christians who used these wells. Now people found this as a valid theory because many Jews wouldn't actually collect their water from public wells they'd source it from rivers and brooks instead but the reason behind this was not because they were poisoning wells and trying to transmit plague to the Christians but because they were actually aware of higher hygienic standards so in other words the Jews at the time knew they were less likely to contract disease from a river than a public well, which whole communities were using. So sourcing their water from a sort of spring or a river or a brook and boiling it, they knew that they were less likely to contract disease from shared wells. Now, unfortunately, people saw them using these rivers thinking, right, they're not using wells, they're obviously poisoning the water sources. And this resulted in mass pogroms across Central and Western Europe. So in September 1348, a trial of a group of Jews admitted under torture, obviously not the fairest uh, system of ju judgment, but this was medieval Europe. So they admitted under torture that they'd poisoned the wells, and in Basel, Stuttgart, Ulm, Speyer and Dresden, groups of Jews were rounded up and burned alive. Now two of the worst examples were in Strasbourg, where 2,000 Jews were massacred, <coughs> Excuse me, and in Mainz, where 12,000 were killed. Now, many Jews from Central Europe fled to Poland amidst these pogroms, and Poland actually remained a principal Jewish sanctuary right up until the Second World War. And even today, there's a strong Jewish population in Poland, and this largely stems from these pogroms in the Black Death. So you could sort of argue that the Black Death led to that in one way. Like, there's a big Jewish sanctuary in Poland. That's a direct consequence of the Black Death, potentially. So another social response was the popular uprisings. So during the Black Death, uh, landholders needed peasants to work more to compensate for those who died of the plague. So obviously in return, many of the peasants demanded higher wages. And there's a great horrible history sketch on this, actually. If you like horrible histories, great show. So in return, many of these peasants demanded higher wages and they'd refuse to work if they were not paid a higher amount. So in England, King Edward III's response was to introduce the Statute of Labourers in 1351. Now, this legislation aimed to reduce peasants' wages to pre-plague levels so that they could not claim for what landholders deemed as excessive wages. So, in France, a similar uprising called the Jacquerie occurred in 1358, largely due to similar reasons. Peasants wanting more wages, landholders not paying them. And even by 1381 in England, the peasants' revolt had broken out, so some connections can actually be linked to the Statute of Labourers and thus the Black Death as a reason for these popular uprisings. So, it shows how like much the Black Death affected the economy of these times. So another response was a religious response. So as we've already discussed, the Pope had fled his papal seat in Avignon to the country, which left many people frustrated at the Catholic Church. Now one of the most recognisable religious responses uh, was the rise in extremists and religious extremism, and a notable group were called the Flagellants. So based primarily in the Low Countries, which is kind of modern-day Belgium, Luxembourg, Netherlands, the flagellants walked from town to town and they whipped themselves as punishment for their sins because they believed that God had sent the plague to earth as a way of punishing mankind. And they believed that by publicly whipping themselves, they could gain penance for their sins. 
Now, naturally, the flagellants were a spectacle that nobody had seen before. <clears throat> so people crowded around in large groups to watch them, no social distancing then. And as a result of walking from town to town, attracting large crowds, the flagellants simply helped spread the plague further into Europe. They're going from one town as a big public spectacle, lots of groups of people coming together, then passing on the disease as they're going along, passing on to one community to another, and so on. And so it spread. I mean, the flagellants were largely responsible for spreading the plague throughout mainland Europe, like the ships were responsible for spreading it through the ports. And obviously, when like the plague arrived in a town or a city, people's response was to flee. So that was. I'll talk about that in a minute about isolation and stuff. Uh, we'll get onto that soon. So another response I looked at was medical responses. So, obviously not often noted for their medical knowledge, medieval doctors had very little idea of how to deal with the Black Death, because most medieval medicine was still based on ancient Greek knowledge of the four humours of the body, and bloodletting as a main of helping to balance the humours. So if your humours were too wet, they'd have to let, let some blood out so you could dry up and things like that. Um, so other useless prescriptions are often prescribed, and two of sort of the funniest I've found out was one of them was including holding an onion under the armpit where there was a bubo or holding a chicken's anus against a bubo. Don't know quite how you'd manage that for a few days, but quite a weird image to have in your head, I suppose. Couldn't find any images out on Google Images, thankfully, because I don't really know if I want to see it, to be honest. But anyway, uh, the Black Death also forced medical science to evolve past the ancient Greek knowledge. And over the course of the next three centuries, significant advancements were made up to the period we know as the Enlightenment. And the Renaissance, so actually the Black Death forced medical science and doctors to actually look beyond ancient Greece and start dissecting bodies in other kind of ways. So another sort of thing I found, going back to quickly to the religious I'll try and squeeze in, is um, the response of saints. So there was a great rise in saints and stuff, and the most famous in plague was Saint Sebastian, who was a Roman saint, and he was shot with loads of arrows, and a lot of painters and artists at the time used this arrow sort of imagery to describe the plague and it was a lot of chroniclers say that it rained down like arrows um, so that was quite an interesting approach sort of religious as well I suppose but anyways I was saying earlier about isolation so quarantine was one of the most significant methods of dealing with the Black Death and the most notable example was the city of Dubrovnik which is in modern day Croatia which self quarantined itself and saved thousands of countless lives so the quarantine period was between 7 and 40 days, and that's not too dissimilar to what's been recommended today. So it was a centre where a lot of people were sent, they had the Black Death, they had to go in there, and if they, came, if they were all right after 40 days, symptoms had gone, they could come back out. And that's really sort of what we're seeing now with the coronavirus, so it was interesting that even seven, 800 years ago, this is still a wide train of thought. So the sort of conclusions I've come to is that hopefully this has given a very brief overview of the Black Death. I know I haven't fit everything in. And if you've got any more questions, please feel free to post in the comments below or drop me an email at historyin20 at gmail.com or find me on Facebook at historyin20. So thanks for listening and I'll catch you next time. See you later.